people when I speak to them. Do you want to speak to them? So let me start with the chant. Om Asatoma Satgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityoruma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om lead us from the unreal to the real Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. I hope all of you can hear me. Those at the back, can you hear me? Yes. Divya, can you hear me? Okay. Um, We are here in this yoga studio and it's, it's very appropriate that we are here today. It all began here in America and in the West with this person, Swami Vivekananda. Some of you may have read in the Wall Street Journal uh, a few years ago, there was an article, the man who bought yoga to the West, and that was Swami Vivekananda. From last year onwards, we have been celebrating the International Day of Yoga uh, on the summer equinox I think in June on June 21st and that's when this article was published that where are the roots of yoga in fact if you read the book American Veda by Philip Goldberg there he traces the the entry and the spread and the influence of Indian philosophy Indian thought in America and the West and he traces it back he begins the book with Swami Vivekananda so he traces the influence of Indian thought, in world thought, especially in America here and in American culture, he starts with Swami Vivekananda. And for those of you who are new to this, this picture is of Sri Ramakrishna, his spiritual master, who is regarded as, if not the greatest, one or certainly one of the greatest spiritual masters of the modern time in India. And then uh, Ma Sharada Devi, whom we call the Holy Mother. She was Sri Ramakrishna's wife, but she's not up there because she was his wife. She is regarded as an equally great saint and spiritual teacher in her own life. I'm saying equally great, but actually if you go to the main monastery in uh, uh, near the river, on, on the river Ganges in near Calcutta, where I've come from, there's a temple to her and there's a much bigger temple to him. And there are more people going all the time to her temple than to <laughs> so, uh, that is Masharada Sri Ramakrishna and his disciple Swami Vivekananda. That Vedanta is here today, that yoga is here today, that I am standing and we are talking about Upanishads here today is to a great extent due to his work. He came here in 1893, the World Parliament of Religions, to talk about Vedanta. Vedanta is the philosophy based on the Upanishads. Since we are standing in the yoga studio here, where you, you learn about asanas and pranayama, different kinds of yoga practices, which are mainly hatha yoga practices, but it's also an entry into the very profound philosophy of the Upanishads. Vedanta and Upanishads are synonymous. In fact, one of the definitions of Vedanta we give uh, when we teach the Vedanta is Vedanta Nama Upanishad Pramanam. In Sanskrit. What does that mean? Vedanta is verily the spiritual knowledge found in the Upanishads. So the Upanishads and Vedanta are the same. What are the Upanishads? The Upanishads are the highest spiritual teachings found in the most ancient scriptures of the Hindus, the Vedas. The Vedas are the ancient scriptures of the Hindus, dated back at least to 6,000 years and maybe and probably much more in oral transmission. And in them, a part of them are the Upanishads, where you find the highest teachings, the highest spiritual teachings. And in fact, the Upanishads form the spiritual, the philosophical core of Hinduism. All of Hinduism can in some form or the other be traced back to the Upanishads. An incredible set of texts. 
there are several of them to talk about that. What I'll do this, this evening is, um, I'm going to give some general introductory remarks about the Upanishads, and then we will take a look at the teaching itself, at the central teaching, and try to see what they are talking about. At least at the end of the talk, we shall the takeaway from the talk will be a general idea about the Upanishads, but more importantly, a central teaching about of the Upanishads. We should know what the central teaching is by the end of the talk. And if we follow very, very carefully, maybe even become enlightened. I'm not promising that. <laughs> uh, so we will. The second part of the talk will be an actual guided practice into the philosophy of the Upanishads, a philosophical inquiry to see who we really are. If, and I invite you to follow that very carefully. But first, a few words about the Upanishads. The, uh, as I said, the Vedanta is based on the Upanishads, and there are many of these Upanishads at the end of the Vedas. Uh, I found it scattered throughout the Vedas, sometimes towards the end of the Vedas. And um, these Upanishads are, um, we talk about 10 principal Upanishads principal major Upanishads and a host of other Upanishads. There is a verse which you memorize when you study the Upanishads. There's a verse which you memorize uh, to recite the names of the ten principal Upanishads. And the verse goes something like this. Isha ena katha prashna mundamandukya titirihi aitareyam chachandogyam Brihat Aran Yakam Tata. These are, it may sound like, I won't say Greek and Latin, sound like Sanskrit. <laughs> because it is. But it's just a list of names of the ten major Upanishads. What are those ten Upanishads? The Isha Upanishad, Kena Upanishad, Katha Upanishad, Prashna Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad, Taittiriya Upanishad, Aitare Upanishad, the Chandogya Upanishad and the Brihadar and Upanishad. So these are the ten major Upanishads. Who decided which are the ma ten major Upanishads? It's just because about 1400 years ago, and this is India, so whenever you talk about old, you begin really, really old. You talk in thousands of years. I, I remember we as a group of young monks were taken on a tour of some old temples in Bengal. In Bengal, the temples are not particularly old. Somebody was showing us a particular temple and saying, this is the oldest temple we've got in, in Bengal, the particular province of India I come from. Uh, and it's about 600 years old. And I could see those monks who had come from other parts of India, especially the south of India, they were smiling. For them, 600 years is not old at all. For them, if you go back a thousand years, that you're beginning to talk now. <laughs> <laughs> so there are temples in, in the south of India which, which are more than a thousand years old. Now about 14 or 1500 years ago, there was this great Indian philosopher, Shankaracharya, who selected 10 of the Upanishads to write elaborate commentaries. And we are grateful to him that he did that because these Upanishads are so old, the language is sometimes so archaic, it's difficult in some cases to make out what they are saying. It's only because he has written those commentaries again in Sanskrit, but now we understand how profound these teachings are. And he selected these 10 Upanishads. So that's why they are called 10 major Upanishads. But there are many others. You can you come across a list of 108 Upanishads in uh, one of the Upanishads themselves, in the Muktika Upanishad, a minor Upanishad, you come across a list of 108 Upanishads where I can't resist telling the story. And that's another thing you have to be ready with, with uh, Indian philosophy. There are stories and stories within stories and stories within stories within stories. <laughs> and somebody said, whenever, whenever you start the Puranas, a class of Indian scriptures, they start at the beginning. And by the beginning, they mean really the beginning. They start at the beginning of the universe. Every story starts with the creation of the universe. <laughs> Um, in the Muktika Upanishad, the story goes like this. The great incarnation of God, Rama, who is God himself, and his great devotee, Hanuman. Now, Hanuman asks Rama, how does one get enlightened? One gets moksha, enlightenment. And Rama says, 
you just read one Upanishad. What is that Upanishad? He says it's the Mandukya Upanishad. Mandukyam ekam eva alam. The Mandukya alone is sufficient. Vimukshunam vimuktai. For the, for the liberation, for the enlightenment of those who want enlightenment. Mandukya, a Mandukya Upanishad is alone, alone is sufficient. And the Mandukya is actually the smallest of the Upanishads. It's just a few mantras. Just a few mantras. Mandukya Upanishad itself without the Karikam. So that the smallest Upanishad is very small. You can just write it down in half a page, the Mandukya Upanishad. And the biggest of the Upanishad, the Brihadaranyaka is, is voluminous, it's really big. So the Upanishads in, in length, these texts are of all sizes. Now I must say they're profound. Schopenhauer, the great German philosopher, uh, he was one of the first Western philosophers to read the Upanishads. And that story in itself is fascinating. I won't go into that because then there's no end to it. You won't be going home before <laughs> 11 o'clock in that case. But uh, the, suffice it to say that a great Mughal prince, Dara Shukha, he was interested in not only Islam but he was interested in Hinduism and he, he got the Upanishads translated from Sanskrit along with the commentaries into Persian. And this Persian version of the Upanishads was called Upanikat. And this was a, a young French Indologist, Anketil Duferon, who was 21 years old when he came to India to search for ancient <coughs> texts. And he got hold of this, this book, the Upanishad, and he got brought it back to France, among other texts, and he translated them into Latin. Into Latin. And this original Sanskrit, translated into Persian, translated into Latin, came into the hands of, he published it, hands of this German philosopher, uh, Schopenhauer. And he is on record as having said that, there, I consider that there is no study in the world as edifying as the study of this Upanika, this text, except perhaps the originals. They have been the solace of my life and they shall be the solace of my death. And uh, he, it seems, I was reading his life, he used to, he would never go to sleep after that without reading a few pages of the Upanishads. And he had this, uh, his little dog, he named the little dog Atma. Definition <laughs> <laughs> means our real self, and uh, so so they are profound. They, they are. I mean, I I have not come across any other body of literature quite like that. Incredible, incredible. We, we shall see a little bit of that today. But first, in general, what do the Upanishads deal with? They deal with the most profound questions of life. Is there any ultimate reality in this universe? Call it God or whatever. Who am I? Who are we? What is the purpose of life? Is enlightenment, salvation, nirvana, moksha, whatever you call it, is it possible? What is it like? What is the purpose of this entire universe? What's the purpse of this game which we have mixed up? The greatest questions, the fundamental questions of life. And all of us, in every civilization, in every time, people have asked these questions. And all of us, we have asked these questions. People, everybody, in fact, asks these questions, especially when we are teenagers. But then we sort of grow. The sadness is we grow out of these questions. The business of living catches up with us, and we grow out of these questions. Um, I was joking, I was telling somebody that if you do not grow out of these questions, you just hold on to these questions, you either become a monk or... <laughs> Or you become a philosopher. And Schopenhauer had an interesting point about that. He used to say that there are two kinds of philosophers. A genuine philosopher and an academic philosopher. He says a genuine philosopher is a person who is puzzled by life. Who looks at life and has these big questions. And an academic philosopher according to him is the one who is puzzled by his books. <laughs> um, but to be fair, among the academic philosophers, many of them are genuine philosophers and many of them came to academic philosophy because they had these questions. And when we are practicing yoga, we get another chance to ask these questions all over again. Um, these Upanishads are about these profound questions. 
And in, in almost all of these Upanishads, you find a dialogue, which reminds you of the Socratic dialogues, you know. The, the person comes to a spiritual master and asks these questions. <coughs> Let's look at some of these questions. And I will recite to you the original Sanskrit. It sounds beautiful. It's, it's, imagine something that was composed, inspired, recited 60 centuries ago, 6,000 years ago, on the bank of the Ganges or the Saraswati River in India. This very language. In the Mundaka Upanishad, we find a student coming to the spiritual master and asking this question. It goes like this. The Sanskrit goes like this. Shaunako Havai Mahashalo Angirasam Vidivadupasanna Patracha Shaunaka, a well-to-do person, comes to the spiritual master Angiras and asks a question. This is mentioned that he comes to the master in the proper prescribed manner. The proper prescribed manner in India is you go down and bow down to the master and make an offering and um, after the salutations you ask your question. What was the question? Kasminnu bhagavo vidyate sarvam idam vidyatam bhavati iti. Sir, O oh Holy Sir, what is that by knowing which I can know everything. What an interesting question to ask. Tell me that by knowing which I can know everything. In another Upanishad, we find a father, a father asking his son, who is back from university. He finds the son has become arrogant. He thinks he knows everything. And what does the old man know anyway? So he is maybe back from an Ivy League university at that time. And the father sees that the guy is this boy, his name is Shweta Ketu. Shweta Ketu has become proud and arrogant. So the father asks him, do you know that by which everything is known? Did, did your teachers teach you that by, which, by knowing which everything is known? Same question. Same question. Eka vijnana sarvam vijnatam. By one knowledge, everything is known. And uh, Shankaracharya's humor is there. You know, the, the, the boy says, no, they didn't teach me. I don't even know that such, a, such, that such knowledge is possible. They didn't teach me. Why don't you teach me? He tells his father. And the commentator, Shankaracharya, humorously adds there that he's scared of being sent back to college again. <laughs> <laughs> he says, why don't you tell me? <laughs> In other places, there's this beautiful story about a little boy who went to meet <coughs> death who went to meet death. The boy's name is Nachiketa. He, it's a favorite story in India. So he goes to, little boy, he may be ten, he's maybe 9 or 10 years old. He goes to meet <coughs> Yama, the lord of death. And he goes there and Yama is pleased with him and grants him boons. You can ask, you can ask me for three boons, three, any three things. And uh, the final boon is the point. In the Kato Upanishad you find, the third thing he asks this little boy, the final thing he asks is, um, okay, I should tell you the first and second. Leave, leave you hanging. You know, it's, it's not a good way to tell a story. <laughs> Basically, his dad was mad, mad at him. The little boy's dad was annoyed with him and said something like, "Today, today here he would say, oh, go to hell, don't bother me. So, more or less he said that. Go to death. Oh, just go to death. And this being a story, he really goes to death, to the, to the house of death. And he confronts death and he asks these three boons. Death gives him three boons, the little boy. So the first thing he asked was, because he's a little boy, first thing he asked was, like a very intelligent little boy, he asks, um, when I go back home, my dad shouldn't be mad at me anymore. He should love me. And that's so cute. You, know? you can see the, the psychology of the little boy. And it's so intelligent too. Nobody ever goes back from death. And this boy, he doesn't say, I should, be, I should go back to life again. He, he assumes it. I'm going back. <coughs> so, so when I go back, my dad should be happy with me. He should love me. So I, we can imagine death smiling, sort of touched, you know, by the <laughs> boy. He says, okay, granted. And the second boon is, uh, there was conventional religion in those days where fire sacrifices. So the little boy says, I see my dad doing these fire sacrifices teach me the best fire sacrifice there is. And so the Lord of Death teaches him that. The third question is the Upanishad. 
what is the secret of death? What lies beyond death? Is there something within us which does not die? Some people say there is, some people say there is not. Tell me the truth. And then the answer starts. So that's another question. In another Upanishad, Kain Upanishad, you find the same question in a much in a very different way. Instead of saying, tell me one thing by which I know everything, the question is, how do I think? By what light within are my thoughts lit up? What inspires my words? How do I speak? How do I see? How do I hear? He is not asking for an explanation of physiology. How does the visual system work? How does an auditory system work? He is asking for one answer. What is that one thing which gives me the conscious first person experience of seeing, of hearing? We are just now in the 21st century beginning to understand this question. In consciousness studies, if you have heard of the hard problem of consciousness, the problem of qualia, how do we get first person experience? How do the brains work and what neurons fire and what activity is going on? That's supposed to be the so-called easy problem of consciousness. But the hard problem of consciousness is how does all this physical activity, biochemical activity, neurological activity, translate into seeing the color red right how do we taste see hear how do we have the conscious experience which is our life and thousands of years ago the question is being asked the Upanishad starts with this question kene shitam padati preshitam mana kena prana pratama prayiti yukta kene shitam vacha vimam padanti Chakshyushrotram Kaudeva Yunakti What light shines in my thoughts? I am aware of my thoughts. By what light are my words inspired? By what light am I able to see, hear, smell, touch? Our conscious life, our whole lives. He is basically asking about what? He is asking about consciousness. The question is about consciousness the real nature of consciousness. He says he calls it what bright being within me shines through my senses and my mind. That's the question. I mean one can only marvel at the depth and the sophistication of these questions. So you have this range of questions and what, are, what about the answer? Let me give you the answer in brief and then we will go into the second part of the presentation where we will guide you through this process. Come, come. Yeah. <laughs> the answer, answer goes like this. I will quote from one of the Upanishads where uh, the answer is found to be let me quote from the Upanishad. It was a favorite with Swami Vivekananda when he came to this country. He would often chant the original Sanskrit, which, which I shall chant for you and then translate. What is the answer to these questions? By knowing what one thing, one knows everything. What is the light within me which shines through all my thoughts and feelings? The answer goes like this. Srinvantu Vishve Amritasya Putraha Aye Dhavani Divyani Tastu Vedaham Purusham Mahantam Aditya Varnam Tamasaparastat Gaveva Viditva Atimrityu Medi Nanya Pantha Vidyati Ayanayat. What does that mean? It's simple Sanskrit but very profound and poetic. It means, listen, ye children of immortal bliss. So the teacher is addressing all of us, all of humanity as children of immortal bliss. Even those who dwell in higher spheres, you know, the gods who dwell in heavens, you will listen to because what I am going to say, you do not know. This highest teaching of the Upanishads. What is that? Vedaham Purusham Mahantam I have realized that infinite being. Purusham Mahantam, infinite being. I have realized this infinite being. I have known that infinite being. What kind of infinite being? Aditya Varnam, blazing forth with a light like the sun. Not a material light like the sun, not a material light like this, the light of consciousness. 
blazing forth. In the Bhagavad Gita, when Arjuna gets this experience in beautiful and awesome poetry, described as, as if a thousand suns rise in the sky together. Not with the material light, we'd be burnt up. It's the light of consciousness. Tamasa Parasta, beyond all darkness, beyond the darkness of suffering and sorrow and death and limitation, there is some immortal reality which is beyond suffering and sorrow, our human limitations. Okay, suppose you have known such a thing, suppose such a thing exists, what good is it? What good does it do us? By knowing that alone, mortal man becomes immortal. One goes beyond death. One goes beyond suffering. Any other way? Any other way? We have other ways of overcoming suffering. You are you're sick, you go to the CVS, go to the doctor. Assuming you have coverage. <laughs> if you don't have coverage, you can tell us a job. You can go and earn money. Um, if you are bored, there's a television for you. Somebody said it's the golden age of television. You don't know, Swami, what you are missing. There's so many TV serials for you to see. <laughs> so, if you're bored, you go to the television or play video games. But none of them are permanent solutions for the human condition. Every one of them has a limitation. They either come to an end and after that you are still dissatisfied, you still want more. Or they do not give you the satisfaction which you, which you wanted from them. When you get it, you finally see this was not worth it. Everything in human life is infected with this problem, except spiritual enlightenment. That's the promise that there is something, an infinite existence. If you realize that, you go beyond the limitations, the human limitations of death, sorrow and suffering. So that's the answer. And all the Upanishads give it in different language. That's one point. But that's just the grand beginning theme. They go to something even greater. Where is this infinite reality? You're talking about an infinite consciousness, an immortal consciousness. Where is it? Where do I find, find it and how do I find it? And here comes the highest teaching of the Upanishads. If there's nothing you go away from this talk with, just go away with this. The Upanishads say with one voice, that thou art. Where is that infinite reality? Brahman, pure consciousness, whatever. You are that. You just don't know it. You are that. In the Upanishads, we find what are called Mahavakyas, the great statements. The great, not in, there you get pretty long sentences in Sanskrit. I've seen sentences, one sentence covering a whole page. But these sentences are short sentences, but they are great because they're profound. And each of these great sentences, we take four in the Upanishads, from different Upanishads. They all mean the same thing. They all mean the same thing. You are that infinite reality. You are that. In the Chandogya Upanishad you find Tat Tvam Asi. That boy who was arrogant and his father began to teach him that infinite reality. And after teaching him that, he says that there is some infinite reality from which this universe has come, in which the universe exists, into which it disappears finally. You can imagine the boy going, so? <laughs> Okay, that's great. But so, what does it have to do with me? And the father tells him, Tat tuamasi Shweta Ketu. Oh my boy Shweta Ketu, you are that infinite reality. Now he can't go so, because we are now talking about him. What's the most interesting subject for each of us? <laughs> I myself, the vertical eye. <laughs> Whether we admit it or not, we are infinitely interested in ourselves. And it's, it's bad when it's the small self we are interested in. We see that it's, it's bad. But it points to something interesting. There is something within us which, which deserves that attention. That thou art Shweta Ketu. You are that infinite self which we are talking about. In the, in the uh, Brihadaranya Kupanishad, we find even more directly. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. Brahman, the infinite reality. I am Brahman. People sometimes get shocked. Are you claiming I am God? 
Brahman, Brahman is the word for God in Hinduism. Are you claiming, are you seriously saying that you are God? Yes, but not just me. You too and everybody and everything is. Whatever we see in this life, whatever we experience, is an appearance of that reality. There's a famous Hindu monk who came to USA also. Now he had a brother who had some mental problems and he was in an asylum in those days. So this monk, he went back to visit his brother and his brother said, you say that I am God. I also say that I am God. And people revere you and fall at your feet and they lock me up. <laughs> <laughs> it's so unfair. It's so unfair. <laughs> then uh, his brother, the monk, explained to him, yeah, when I say I am God, I mean all of us are one with God. Everybody, irrespective of gender or caste or color, uh, not even just human beings. All beings are one with God. We share the same divine essence. We are that. But the mistake you make is you say, I am God, worship me. And they lock you up, of course. <laughs> Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. In the Mandukya Upanishad, the little Upanishad I mentioned, which is the most, most uh, powerful of the Upanishads, there you find, I am Atma Brahman. This very self is Brahman. Same meaning, that thou art, I am Brahman, this very self is Brahman, they all mean the same thing. And in the Aitiriya Upanishad you find Pragyanam Brahma, consciousness, this consciousness within, right now, this awareness, this sentience which we all experience, if you properly understand this, that is the infinite, conscious, the infinite divine reality, Brahman. So these four sentences are called Mahavakyas. All of them mean the same thing and all of them are the core teaching of the Upanishads. Um, okay, I think that, that, that's good as an advertisement, I mean like an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, shall we look deeper? <coughs> Let's look deeper. What is this infinite reality? And how am I this infinite reality? And how can I know it? And how can I realize it? If that is the question, and that should be our question, can you show us a little more? Let's see a little more. Um, the Upanishads say that to realize this reality is the purpose of life. Swami Vivekananda, he put it more directly. Each soul is potentially divine. To manifest this reality, to manifest this divinity is the goal of religion. And all religious practices, whether you are meditating, whether you are de doing devotional practices, worshipping God, whether you are serving, doing good to others, or whether you are following the path of knowledge. The, this last one is what we are doing now. The path of knowledge, Jnana Yoga. By any one of these means, or by all of them, you realize the truth that you are Brahman and be free. This is the whole of religion. B books, temples, doctrines, churches, they are all secondary details. The real thing is to realize the divine within ourselves and be free of the sufferings of life. All the spiritual practices, he mentions uh, Jnana Yoga, the path of philosophical inquiry, which is what we shall see today. Bhakti Yoga, the path of love, of devotional worship of God. Raja Yoga, the path of meditation. To which is related the, to the Hatha Yoga that you do in a yoga studio. Raja Yoga is the path of meditation. To which is related the Hatha Yoga, the Ashtanga Yoga and everything that you do in a yoga studio. He mentions Karma Yoga, the path of service to all beings. Worshipping God in all beings through service. All of these paths. They have only one goal. The paths are different. The practices are different. They have only one goal. Ultimately to know and realize this infinite reality within. Brahman within. So let's see. This is the second part of the talk. Um, we'll take up any one of these approaches. Any one of the Upanishads. Let me take it up. I thought of taking up the Taittiriya Upanishad. One of the Upanishads. Now from here, you have got to walk with me. Because they are going to take us step by step 
deep within ourselves to uncover something we did not know that existed. The divine self within ourselves. That Brahman infinite existence. So the Upanishad starts, the second chapter of the Upanishad starts like this. Brahma Vidapnoti Param The knower of Brahman attains the highest. This statement. What I'm going to say from now on till the end is an explanation of this statement. What is the statement? The knower of Brahman attains the highest. If the knower of Brahman attains the highest, we, sh we have or we should have three questions. What is this blessed Brahman you are talking about? What is it? Define it. And how do you know Brahman? Second. And what do you mean by the highest? What do I actually get? What happens when I, when I know Brahman? Three questions. And then proceeds to answer. Tad esha vyukta satyam jnanam anantam brahma It is said, question number one, what is Brahman? It is said, Brahman answer. The answer is, Brahman is infinite existence consciousness. Satyam, existence. Jnanam, consciousness. Anantam, infinite. Brahman is infinite existence consciousness. I will not go into the details of this. This does not concern us today. But if you are interested in going deeper into this, I have a talk on YouTube. Just search Defining God on YouTube. You'll get it. <laughs> the whole talk is about Satyam Jnana Marantam Brahman. This definition of Brahman. It's about that. But now we go to the second question. How do I know that I'm Brahman? We don't have much time. So, definition we'll leave it theoretical later on. But let's just realize Brahman right now, <laughs> before we, we run out of time. So we will concentrate on the second question. How do I realize Brahman? And the answer given is, Yo Veda Nihitam Guhayam Paramev Yoman. What does it mean? It means, who... Hello? <laughs> it means, who realizes Brahman in the sacred space of his, his or her own heart. What does that mean, sacred space of the heart? It's very simple. It means you have to realize Brahman as I am Brahman. How do you realize Brahman? Not that this thing is Brahman or this deity is Brahman or that light is Brahman or the universe is Brahman. But you have to realize it as I am Brahman. How do you do that? We'll come to that. But the third question, let me just touch upon it. What does it mean attains the highest? What is the highest? So Ashnute Sarvan Kaman Saha Brahmana Vipashchite What you attain through this whole process, when you become enlightened, it, you come to the culmination of all desires. Everything that one could have wanted in life, you, you get the fulfillment of all desires. You think, oh, I want an Xbox and I want candy and I don't want to go to school. <laughs> if I realize Brahman, do I get all of that? <laughs> all my lists, Christmas lists, all of that, do I get it at once? No, not in that sense. What it means is, you become one with the universe, with Brahman. You become one with Brahman. In that sense, the entire, all desires are culminated, finished there. That, that's, the, that's the meaning. That is equal to moksha, nirvana, salvation, whatever you call it. Now, the, the real point of this presentation, the process. The process starts here. He says, um, how do I realize that I am Brahman? The Upanishad says, what do you think you are? Let's start with what you think you are. If I ask you, who are you? Most of us will say, why, here I am. This is who I am. This person here. The body. So do you think you are the body? Yeah. It starts there. And the Upanishad says, take a look at the body. We think we are the body. But if you take a look at the body, the Upanishad guides us step by step. The body is changing. The body was a little baby, was a young boy, was a teenager, was a young man or woman, middle-aged person, this old person, and that person they're carrying in the coffin to the graveyard. That's the body. 
and I see I'm the same person who was a kid, I'm the same person who was a middle-aged person, I'm the same person who's old now. But the kid, middle-aged person and old, it all refers to the aging of the body. Is that not so? This rather elderly lady told me a few weeks ago that, you know Swami, it's true. I was passing by a window and I saw this old lady in the window looking at me. I thought, who is she? And I realized it's me. <laughs> when did I get like that? In my mind's eye, I'm still that young girl. So, the body ages, body is subject to change. I don't feel, I'm the witness of these changes. I can't be the, how can you be both unchanging and changing at the same time? The body is a second. The body is an object of my perception. The body is an object of my perception. What does that mean? This shirt is an object of my perception. I am the one who sees the subject. This shirt is an object. I know it. The subject and the object are never the same. Think about it. What you see must be different from your eyes. Is that not so? Tell me one, one thing that you cannot see with your eyes. The eyes themselves, yes. You can see a picture of your eyes, you can see a reflection of your eyes, but the eyes cannot see themselves directly. The seer and the seen are different. The subject and the object are different entities. You know your body. Just as you know everything here, you know the clothes you are wearing, you know the body also. You can see the body, you can touch the body, you can feel the body. So the body is an object of your knowledge. You are the knower of the body. The knower and the known, the subject and the object, they have to be two different entities. You may be within the body, but you are not the body. You experience the body just like you experience the clothes you are wearing, the seat you are sitting on. Being the knower, the body is the known, you cannot be the body. Okay, this is enough to be going on. There are many, many other reasons. There is no time for that. But they all point out that point that you are not the body. You do you think that you are the body. Okay, you say, oh, well, that sounds reasonable. Then what could I be? The Upanishad says, look deeper. What's more subtle than the body, what's interior to the body? You have this feeling, I'm within the body. Like I put on the clothes, I put on the body. So you have something within the body. Okay, what are you within the body? They speak about prana. <coughs> they speak about prana. The bo body, they call it annamaya, made of food. They call the body made of food because it's a transformation of food. What we eat and drink is this body. Somebody called it food rearranged. <laughs> food is arranged on your plate. When you eat, you, re you rearrange the food and that's the body. Anna, Annamaya, the food, food of body. And um, when we say I am not the body, the body becomes a cover for me, whoever I am. Being a cover, it's called a kosha. Kosha is something that covers. So the body is annamaya kosha, the food sheath. What's deeper than the body, interior to the body, subtler than the body? You feel it all the time. <coughs> Breathing. What do you call it in yoga? Prana. Life forces. Breathing. Our blood pounding through the veins. Uh, food being assimilated. When you feel healthy, when you feel sick, when you feel energetic, when you feel tired, it's prana, it's life forces. So am I life? Am I life? Am I the prana? Am I the prana? You can ask that question. The same logic applies there. Does, does the prana change? Does the prana change? Yeah, it changes. Sometimes I'm hungry, sometimes when I eat I'm satiated, sometimes I feel energetic, sometimes I feel tired. It's true. Sometimes I'm breathing in, sometimes I'm releasing the breath, sometimes I'm holding the breath. The, the forces of prana flow, they ebb and flow through this body. They are continuously changing. I am the one who was tired, I am the one who was sick, I am the one who is energetic, I am the one who is feeling uh, good now, I'm feeling uh, healthy. Same person who sees the changes of the prana. So the prana changes. Not only that, are we aware of the prana? Of course we are. 
there is a whole, I don't know if you do it in this yoga studio, there is a whole uh, industry of teaching you mindful breathing. Mindfulness, mindfulness of the breath. Mindfulness of the breath is what? Be aware of your breathing. But what Upanishads will tell you is, it's good to be aware of your breathing. But notice the fact, you are that which is aware of the breath. You are that which is aware of the breath. You are the subject, the breath becomes the object. Hence prana, the life forces, they are the object. You are that which is aware of the prana. You cannot be the same thing. You cannot be the prana. You are something, the prana is an object of your awareness. The prana is changing. Same, same reasons. Changing because it's changing, because it's an object, you cannot be the prana. You are the witness of the prana, of the changes of the prana. You are something interior to the prana, you are something subtler than the prana. So the prana becomes another sheep, a covering for you. It's called the prana maya kosha, the sheep of life forces. It's called the sheep of life forces. Prana maya kosha. What's subtler than the prana? What's interior to the prana? The mind. The Upanishad says the mind. And here we have it. Most educated, grown up, mature people think of themselves as minds in a body. Most of us we feel that we are this person in the body. We are this person in the body. As a mind embodied in this physical body. Now, are we the mind? Now you can do, you are equipped, you have the techniques, apply the same techniques, does the mind change? You say, oh yes it does, all the time, very fast, throughout the day. Right now I'm feeling upbeat, next moment I'm feeling sick, and I'm, I, don't, I don't feel good. I'm feeling happy, next moment I feel irritated. Right now I don't understand, next moment I understand. So, mind keeps on changing. Memory, mind includes memory also. Sometimes I can remember, sometimes I can't remember. It's, you say tip of the tongue, I can't remember. So mind changes. I am, I am aware of the changing mind. Is the mind an object of your awareness? We normally do not think that the mind is an object. We identify the mind with the subject. Mind is the subject and the world is the object. But are we not aware of the mind? If you are happy, are you not aware of the feeling of happiness in the mind? If not, who else is? If you are not aware of your own happiness or misery, who else is? I am aware of the happiness in the mind. I am aware of the misery in the mind. Mind is an object of awareness. Mind is continuously changing. Because it is changing, because it's an object of awareness, it can't be me. The mind becomes a sheep. It's called Manomaya Kosha. The sheep of the mind, Manomaya Kosha. You are something interior to the mind, subtler than the mind. What is interior to the mind and subtler than the mind? And the Upanishad makes a division here between the mind and the intellect. What is the intellect here? That which we are using right now to understand <coughs> all of this, hopefully. <laughs> that faculty we are using now, trying to understand this, that's the intellect. That which understands. Am I the intellect? Most people, many people do get identified with intellect, especially intellectuals. <laughs> <laughs> but now you can use the same instruments. Does the intellect change? Of course it does. What I did, did not understand as a kid, I understood in college. What I did not understand in college, I've understood by growing up. Many of the things I've understood in college, I've forgotten now. <laughs> the intellect keeps changing. And is the intellect, are you aware of the functioning of the intellect? Yeah, that too. There is something within me which is aware of the functioning of the intellect. The intellect is an object, a very subtle object. But a, nevertheless, an object of my awareness. Intellect is an object of my awareness. I am not the intellect either. I am the witness of the intellect. Now here we have gone pretty far. Most people identify themselves with the mind and intellect. We identify ourselves with this person who is in this body. With a little person, with the personality. But you are here you are saying, if you are aware of it, if you know it, then it cannot be you. You are the knower of the intellect. 
Recently, I was at a university up north. When I was talking about this, a mathematician, emotionally, he said to me, you know, the professors in our university, in our department, they need to know this. <laughs> Why? Because they're so, especially in the mathematics department, you're so deeply identified with the intellect. And mathematics is a young man's game. By the time you're 40 or 50, you've done the best part of your life's work. <laughs> and what happens is, these people are so identified with their powerful intellects, once powerful intellect. Now, as you fall behind, you are not as quick as you used to be. They feel an inferiority complex. They struggle to keep up. You know, so there are so many sad tales of once great teachers and researchers who are writing papers which are now worthless. And they feel this terrible thing that we are being left behind. We are far behind the field, which we once dominated. Now, if because I am identified with the intellect, I suffer. I think I am falling apart. I think there is something wrong with me. No. It's an instrument. It's a car which I used. It's become old. It doesn't work so well. That's all. You could relax. Yeah, you could relax. Imagine the relief of knowing that nothing is wrong with you. It's just this equipment called the intellect which is slowing down, which happens to everybody. I could tell you more about this, but anyway, the researcher was so emotional about it. It would save so much emotional pain to these people. I am not the intellect either. The intellect is a sheet. It is something that covers me. In, in the Sanskrit, Vigyanamaya Kosha. Vigyanamaya Kosha. I am something interior to the intellect, subtler than the intellect. We are getting into really subtle realms now. Remember, at each of these stages, we are expected to understand what they are saying, we are expected to get it, and we are expected to notice it. That yes, it's a fact. Not just understand it as philosophy. When you say, is the, is the table observed? So, yeah. Is it theory? Well, it's a fact. I'm observing the table. In the same way, I've observed the body. Is the body observed? Yeah. Yes, it is. Is it a fact or is it philosophy, theory, theory or abstraction? It's a fact. The Upanishad is just repeating the facts of life to us. Bringing into notice something we do not notice otherwise. So, at every step that the intellect is an object of my awareness is a fact right now whether you are a Vedanta follower or not only we do not notice it Vedanta Upanishad just asks us to notice it it's not you it's a covering in fact by now whatever we regarded as ourselves this body and our memories and our thoughts and our desires and this personality we call ourselves all of this has become a covering we are something deeper than that. And the Upanishad goes on to say there is another fact of our experience which is deeper than that. What? Every day in the night we have an experience where the body shuts down. <coughs> when the body shuts down, we go to sleep, we dream in the mind. But when the mind shuts down, we have what is called dreamless sleep, deep sleep. In deep sleep, what's your experience or my experience? We we'll normally say, oh, I don't have any experience in, I do not experience anything. I experience nothing in sleep. I do not have any experience in sleep. The Upanishad tells you, it's not that you do not have any experience in sleep. You have the experience of nothingness in deep sleep. You have the experience of absence in deep sleep. Come, come. If you have no objection to sitting on the floor, come. If, uh, the Upanishad says, deep sleep is an experience. It's not the absence of experience, rather it's the experience of absence. Deep sleep is the experience of absence. When you experience that blankness, 